How's everyone doing? Oh my God, the people I paid are not here. How is everyone doing? Three people responded, we're making progress, we'll almost get there. One more time, how are you all doing? Bonjour à tous. Ça va? Merci, merci. Good morning everyone, how are you? My name is uh, Larry. Uh, please help me welcome Soren Toft, the CEO of MS MSC on the stage as we begin this conversation. Soren, please. We're just going to take one more second to get the table, uh, the chair out of the way so it's just Soren and I talking here and not you distracted by all the chairs that we're not using on the stage. That's okay? Fantastic. All right. Now that that's almost done, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, for the second time, I believe, at Africa CEO Forum, Soren Toft, CEO of MSC. Welcome back to Abidjan. Thank you very much. You love coming having... back to this city. Absolutely. <laughs> you are the CEO of the world's largest shipping company. So I'm sure you took a lot from that last conversation about net zero targets and decarbonization and all of that. I will get to it in a second. First of all, I was recently in Port Sudan, where, as you know, there's been a conflict in the country, but I was surprised that the port was operating. I arrived maybe around 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in Port Sudan, and there were cranes lifting um, containers out of ships, and that's operating. Do you want to talk a little bit about have your operations into that uh, port been affected at all? Do you even call on that port? Yeah, we can we can certainly talk about that. I mean, uh, first of all, it's a, it's a tragedy what's happening there, uh, first of all. And we have, of course, looked after all of our people in all the different entities in the MSC group. Uh, so glad so far they're not affected. But it's a, it's a real tragedy. And in Port Sudan, we see, of course, uh, massive waiting times. They were there already before, but it's, it's even further uh, procrastinated. So th this is the reality. But the port is working. Uh, that's, 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 that's the case. How bad are the waiting times? Is it 3x, 4x more? I, I, don't, I, I will not know it from the top of my head, but I would say three, four weeks easily. Three, four weeks waiting time. Yeah. So that's significant. All right. The big question for a lot of people here, you completed in December the acquisition of Bolore Africa Logistics. A big deal, $6.1 billion that brought on 21,000 extra employees. And you just recently rebranded it to Africa Global Logistics. So what's the vision here for this organization and how does it fit into the wider MSC um, footprint? Well, I mean... We are extremely happy that we can now call uh, the AJL people, our, our colleagues, more than 21,000, as you say. Uh, and uh, for us, it was a very important uh, deal. I mean, MSC, in, in the first place, saw Africa as a very, very important uh, place in the, in the world. And basically, with the, with the acquisition of AGL, we could significantly strengthen uh, this, uh, this scope. Uh, there were already strong bonds between uh, two family companies. Uh, we have uh, full commitment behind AGL for continuing to develop um, their, their footprint. And with MSC as, uh, as the owner, obviously we can also increase the future commitments of continuing to invest in Africa, be it on the port side, the land side, and, and everywhere around. So that's really, for us, the, the, the main logic for, uh, for doing it. We believe in Africa. Um, we believe also in the industrialization of, uh, of Africa that's going to that's gonna come. So, uh, so for us, it was a great and very, very important uh, step. But AGL will continue to operate as an independent uh, player. They are serving the whole market. They are serving all shipping lines in, in many cases. And it's important that they keep that uh, integrity and it's important that they continue to, to be uh, you know, a value-adding uh, player. But of course, with the support of MSC, we can further the commitments for the future. That's actually the question I wanted to ask. Why, why did you make the decision that this would continue to operate as an independent entity, uh, considering you already have an inland transportation and logistics operation with Medlock, right? Well, uh, first of all, it's not always, unfortunate that one plus one becomes two. Uh, so uh, 
we had every in interest in the world to make sure that we keep as much. Secondly, uh, BAL or now AGL is an incredible, uh, gifted, talented and very important entity in Africa. So for us, it's very important that they kept their their independence. They, they kept their, uh, let's say, their own their own spirit, their own entrepreneurial spirit, so they can continue uh, to evolve. That was really the main thrust. Then, of course, there are some things around where AGL is a common user terminal operator, so they have to serve the whole market. We want to preserve that. Of course, we are pushing them to become more productive, more efficient, so that the port calls can go faster, not only for MSC ships, but for the whole market as we industrialize in Africa. So that's really the, the key logic uh, behind it. Yes, we are looking at realizing synergies where we can. Uh, that's not forbidden, it would be logical, but we have to do it in the spirit of keeping AGL as an agnostic uh, entity. I know you recently renewed your uh, operation and your presence in Pointe Noire in Congo as a gateway also into Central Africa. So talk about the rationale for that and what are the bright spots do you see in what parts of the continent? Well, uh, Point Noir, and we can add to that uh, additional projects uh, on the way in Matadi, in Walwich Bay, several inland projects, several warehousing projects. It's, it's all a testament to the commitment we have and the belief we have in the continued development of, uh, of Africa. Obviously, we have taken on board, in addition to the few concessions we had as the MSC group, we have taken on, on board a lot of the concessions of, of AGL, but we still see uh, further opportunities. So that's really uh, what it is. We, we didn't have a significant uh, at all presence in Congo or DRC, but with, the, with these two uh, moves, we're now uh, doing that. And on the back of doing what we did in Pona and Matadi, we are also now establishing own agencies. MSC were not represented there before. So it's simply part of our growth story. I hear a lot. I've been covering um, business on this continent for um, a long time. And everybody says, we're committed to Africa. We're committed to Africa. What does that mean like for you tangibly? You talked about obvious Wolvis Bay and Point Noir and whatnot. What kind of extra investment, what kind of extra attention are you paying to the continent? I think, first of all, commitment to Africa means that you have a long-term mindset. Uh, you cannot be committed to Africa if you're just looking for the next uh, quarterly earnings. Uh, it's not going to work. So you really have to have a long-term orientation. That's, you know, first and foremost. Then, of course, you need to be committed, like you say, with, with funds that you're willing to invest, you're willing to look at projects that's, you know, going to be with you for 10, 20, 30, 40, uh, 50 years. And that's, that's really the outlook and the, and, and the commitment we have to, uh, to Africa. Uh, the demographic development is uh, undisputable. I mean, Africa in the last 20 years grew uh, with a population the size of the EU, 600 million since, 20, uh, two, or since 2000 to 2020, and we'll see another 1 billion or so uh, grow. And if the GDP per capita doubles or triples, which is not a lot because it's coming from a very low base, obviously there will be tremendous opportunities in this continent. And, it, and we need to make sure opportunities are coming here. We need to make sure the opportunities for employment for all of the Africans. So the solution to the issues of Africa is not happening abroad. They need to happen in Africa. As you know, especially at the Africa CEO Forum, we talk a lot about the African continental free trade area. Wam Kelemene, who leads that, was on panels this yesterday. It's an important part of how we break down the boundaries and borders and you know trade across different continents and shipping and logistics and what you do is at the center of that. Yet, it remains deeply inefficient. Trade in this continent is deeply inefficient. The borders do not work. It takes days to move things from one uh, country to the other. Those wait times to talk about the port. So talk about your thinking around this and how you're helping kind of speed this along. Yeah, I guess it's fair to say that, that the African free trade uh, uh, thing is not really taken off in any way. At least we have not yet seen massive benefits. Right. All the leaders say the right things, but the actual tangible work is not really but, bearing fruit yet. Yeah, but we'll continue to, to work with them. But, but for us, the solution is also not so much in what we say, but in what we do. So it's in the investments that we make. It's in the continued renewals of the concessions that we do. It's in the new projects that we have. It's the fact that we continue to expand uh, on land. That's, that's the commitment and, and the contribution we can, uh, we can give. Will we work with, uh, with AFTA? Of course we will. But, 
it needs to be it needs to be efficient it needs to work otherwise there's no point then it'll be a lot of conversations so maybe it's a bit of a harsh uh, way of putting it but i think for the msc group our contribution will be the commitment and the investment and the long term mindedness that we have on this uh, on this continent okay so let's pick up on that conversation we heard in the last um, panel about decarbonization, net zero, shipping is a huge emitter, one of the worst offenders um, in this current regime. You've talked a lot about how you're trying to limit your supply chain emissions by using uh, biofuels and whatnot. What's your thinking here? What are you doing specifically and what is the grand vision? Well, uh, decarbonization is a, is a battle that we have to uh, fix not maybe should fix so we have to understand that we are all uh, you know many of us are, are parents to kids and you know we are we want to you know be responsible business people so decarbonization is part of that uh, agenda for sure um, there is no easy solution that's the problem today you can easily build a ship and manufacture the engine to you know become green the problem is in the availability of fuels so all shipping lines more or less are investing in green ships they are all dual fuel because we cannot run the risk that suddenly we can't go to the gas station and suddenly there's not the gas that we uh, that we want so we all investing in, in dual fuel ships we have different I think philosophies uh, the different companies and that's fine I mean some believe more in one product some believe more in another I think what we can say with, with quite a bit of certainty is that because of the scarcity of the green fuels, we're going to see a multi-fuel uh, approach. So there'll be ships running on LNG, there'll be ships running on methanol, there may be ships running on ammonia, and so on and so forth, because the availability of fuel is At MSC, we have, we have chosen a, a pathway on, on LNG. We know that fossil LNG isn't the solution but it already improves 20 percent if you add that with biomethane you already get to 34 or 43 depending on the mix of you. and then we'll do probably methanol and, and other things so that's that's the real challenge that is the availability of the, of the fuel and then let me also say we are lacking real regulation there's no regulation in the, in the world there's no global price on carbon there is no real R&D fund that could have been put under the IMO where you could put a tax on fuel and then you can use that money to invest in real solutions every single company and this is the real problem is trying to become the expert of the future fuel which is a little bit of a miss right we are a shipping company we are a logistics company we're a terminal company we are not a fuel uh, producer but we are forced and we do it to now become experts in that part too yeah i saw you did a deal recently you announced a deal with db Schenker on uh, a biofuel solution so is that part of the same advancement yeah, so biofuel is, is there today, but it's not there in the quantities that you can decarbonize the whole, uh, the whole shipping. But we are offering it as a product to our clients if they want to, you know, ship more green, uh, so to speak. But we have to remember this uh, biofuel competes with other sectors. In fact, if you, if you want to put it like this, it's maybe even wrong that shipping consumes biofuel because it's better used in the sky that all the airplanes would use it from a, from a climate impact point of view. But we're doing it because there's a demand and a growing demand from our clients. Uh, let's talk about your outlook. Back in October, you tweeted uh, and you predicted a couple of uh, upcoming quarters of some headwinds. I want to read back some of that tweet for you, and then you can defend your tweet. Oh, geez. what did I say? <laughs> if you still stand by it, uh, you cited uh, rising inflation, rising interest rates, and rising energy prices. And so there's some difficult quarters ahead. And that's still the same situation right now, even though you tweeted this back in October. So do you still think there's still some difficulty ahead? I think uh, for once maybe our prediction was not too bad, but we were also coming from an extreme high. So you could almost argue it could only go uh, one way and that was, uh, that was down. But of course, we have since the middle of last year seen the effect of uh, the inflation, the effect of the, the energy prices, the, the effect of the interest rates. Uh, and at some point when the world came out of the, let's say, the COVID situation, obviously a lot of the physical consumption went into the services and travel and leisure. So it's almost uh, obvious. I think uh, probably many people in the room here also bought that extra TV they didn't need. And, and therefore, on the back of serious, serious physical consumption came a, a moment of, let's say, a, a bit more uh, relaxation. But I, I, I see uh, basically that 
Now, after two, three quarters where it's, where it's been like this, we are seeing things slowly, slowly uh, pick up. Right. Uh, and I still expect that there'll be a, a further slight improvement in the, in the growth outlook in the, in the second half of, uh, of the year. Will it be a, a massive spurt like we saw with COVID? No, that I don't believe in like nobody predicted what happened as a as a result of COVID, right. but will there be slight improvements in the second half? Yeah, I would expect so on the demand side. When you look at your global dashboard, what keeps you up at night? What do you worry most about in your operation across the world? I think uh, in the next decade, two decades, there's going to be a few uh, themes for us as a, as a global company operating in 155 plus countries. Uh, first of all, there will always be a fire somewhere. Right. Uh, that's there's always a fire to put out. There's always a fire somewhere. That you have to uh, expect. But I think th some of the, I mean, the key themes we're going to be, be faced with in the next one, two decades will certainly be the, the macroeconomic situation and the macro politic situation that we're seeing. We're seeing you know, protectionism. We're seeing the situation in the world in general. Of course, we have a terrible war in Ukraine and how that maybe affects uh, other parts of the world. So that's, that's going to be a big theme. But again, we cannot uh, affect it. I mean, if there's going to be a conflict somewhere, we're going to have to deal with it. It's not like you know, we can change the outcome of whether that conflict is going to be there or not. Uh, the second big theme we talked about is for sure decarbonization, because decarbonization is not something you saw that the flick of a switch. This is a one, two, three decade change. Um, for instance, we operate today 750 plus uh, container vessels. If tomorrow we were asked to go and scrap them and build new ones, that would be terrible. Right. Environment. That goes to the heart of So it's a transition. And the third, I think, big theme we're going to be dealing with, and we have been and continue with, will be uh, the whole digitization situation. Now a lot of talk is on AI and so on, but the whole shift uh, from the more manual to the more digital. I think those are going to be the main themes we as a company are going to be, uh, be dealing with. Okay, I have a leadership question for you in a moment, but I wonder if there are any questions in the audience that I can take right now just because I can and you're all sitting here and you came to listen to Soren Taft going once going twice any questions going three times okay gone um, the leadership question I have for you is when you run an operation as big as yours in over 150 countries like you mentioned with thousands of employees how do you manage when you can't be everything everywhere all at once and be effective still? Well, the, I think the first answer to that is you have to have some great, good, committed, uh, loyal people, which we, which we do, because we can't be everywhere. But uh, you also have to accept, and whether it's in business or it's in sports, that if you want to do at least what I do, uh, it takes a lot of time. You can't get away with this on 40 hours, so we probably spend the double. Uh, and you have to be in the details. To understand what's going on, you can't just sit uh, far removed. So yes, we are making on one instance big decisions, and another one we try to deeply understand a problem in a certain uh, in a certain part. And I think uh, you know to be a good leader, to make good uh, strategic decisions, also requires that you actually know the materia and don't just uh, surface too much uh, the wave. So that's right. that's a little bit what we do. But yeah, of course, I mean. How can you run a company with more than 100,000 people if you don't have great people? And does that mean also that then you know what they do down to the, the details? So you don't, you're not just a guy who sees everybody's... Um, you're not a big picture guy, but you're also a, a small details kind of guy? I think you have to straddle both. I think you have to be able to move very quickly from one end of that specter to the, to the other one. Do I understand what everybody does in detail? No, but I guess... I mean, I spent a little bit more than 30 years in this industry, so I picked up some experience along the way, and, and I still try to go and put my hands into the weeds every single day, every single, uh, every single week. You need to understand deeply what's going on to be an effective leader and to make great decisions. So I want to end where we began with your Africa operation, obviously with the added um, extra AGL colleagues coming in in that operation. So what does it look like across shipping, inland, all of that on the continent? Well, with, uh, with AGL now part of the family, we believe we have a, a great strength and a great offering to our customers in, uh, in Africa. But we are, we are far from done. We, have, uh, you know, we, didn't, we didn't acquire AGL to defend it. We acquired AGL to 
grow it and to continue to uh, to develop it. And that's exactly what uh, what we are intending uh, to do. We have, of course, as you say, not only AGL, we have MSC, we have Medlock, we have TIL, and we have a number of other things that we would like to, you know, expand with on the on the continent. So AGL is a very important uh, piece in the puzzle, a very big. A piece in the puzzle, and we covered uh, the way that uh, we want them to operate. But of course, we want all entities in the MC group to collaborate and right. to ultimately deliver better productivity, better outcomes for the for the clients. And that, that's what we're here to do. Okay, the only thing left to do is your final closing thoughts for these people here. You know what the kind of profile of people who come to the Africa CEO Forum are: the business leaders, policy makers, CEOs of their own in different industries. Well, I noticed nobody had a question, so either, either, either you were very succinct or it went over their head. They did not understand yeah, yeah. a single so, thing. So that's maybe one of the conclusions. No, I don't. I don't think we have. Uh, I don't think I have anything to add other than uh, you know, for us, uh, Africa is a very, very important part of our of our global business. It's not always an easy place to to do business, so you have to be patient. Um, and you have to have a, a long-term perspective, but it's very promising. Uh, there are lots of opportunities, and there are many, many great people delivering every single day uh, for us. So that's that's my uh, key takeaway, and that's why I'm spending a day and a half here to meet a lot of interesting people and to make sure that we can further our operations here, and also in the next decades. Right. Many great people delivering every day, despite the circumstances, despite the difficulty. They just walk right over it and uh, do what needs to be done. Soren Toft, thank you so much. Thank it's you. been great having you back here. Please give him a big round of applause.